Hello and welcome um, to talk on Shaq on a pole. I'll pass you over to Les now. Okay, um, good afternoon everybody if you're in the UK and hello to everybody else. Um, this talk is not specifically about radio, it's about constructing things mechanically, I suppose. So uh, bear that in mind as we go. So I seem to have um, no control over the slides. If you use your arrow keys on your keyboard. Yeah, that's what I'm go. using. Okay. Um, I'll go to the next slide on the... I mean, if you just click, left click as well on the slide, that should take you to the next slide. No, not doing anything. Um, if you hit next, that will work as well. Okay, yeah, that's yeah. fair enough. Um, right, you can perhaps see on the side there a picture of what I call the soap, the shack on a pole. I was taken to hospital by ambulance a few years ago because my wife thought I was having a heart attack. Oh, and once there, they kept me under observation by putting me onto a heart rate monitor. Now, I knew I hadn't had a heart attack. Frankly, I was pretty bored for a day and a half. My main amusement was seeing how much I could raise and lower my heart rate by varying my breathing. When you've got a color screen monitor to play that game with, it has its merits. However, looking at the stand the monitor was on set me thinking. It had wheels to trolley it around, a handle to pull it by, a place to fix a keyboard and screen, room for a power supply and various other bits of equipment were hanging off it. That thing could earn a place in a radio shack. But I could guess the cost and I confirmed that cost once I got it home. But I like a challenge that making something provides, so I set out to make a similar device specific to my radio use and enable me to put my shack on a pole. My soap, my shack on a pole, cost me less than 10 pounds in materials and an enjoyable time in my garage putting it together. And this chat is about um, how I did it and also to encourage you to get making something, anything, from scrap and cheap materials. But first a warning. The way the items were sourced to make this thing and the absolute cost of, this, of the soap was based on a particular lifestyle and a way of doing things. I call it skip scrabbling. The Americans call it dumpster diving. My wife walks away from me when I spot a skip because she knows I'm going to bring shame on the family and some obscure item home to the garage. I'm not able to offer you an estimate of the social cost of this project or the social cost of that kind of way of life. You adopt it at your peril. Right, having got that clear, let's move on. This is more or less a modular project. If the whole thing is not what you want, some of the module ideas might be useful to you. So let's get to the soap and along the way, a few other bits and pieces which may be usable. The pole is the key to this. And the poles I use are homemade efforts. They're aerial poles, short elements to build a portable vertical aerial that I've used on the beaches and in the countryside in England, Wales and Malta. They're simply aluminium tubing for which I made threaded end plugs, male one end, female the other, so that they can be screwed together or fitted to other sometimes commercial aerial parts. Not that I have any commercial aerial parts, you understand, but you might want to use them for that. And I decided a long time ago that the threads used on all my aerials would be 3824 UNF. 
That's the standard used by most, but not quite all, aerial manufacturers. It means 3 8 nominal diameter, 3 8 of an inch nominal diameter, and 24 threads per inch, United National Fine. It's part of a thread system worked out between the UK and the USA just after the Second World War to standardize industrial screw threads on shared equipment. Using that thread size will mean all of your homemade stuff will be compatible with almost every commercial aerial part that you might also want to use. You use whatever thread system you like, but I would strongly suggest the UNF UNC system for aerials. Whatever you choose, make that standard invariable on your equipment or else one day you'll end up with two parts with different threads jammed together and ruined. Because your mates don't necessarily share your knowledge of your homemade gear. And if you don't make the mistake, somebody else will. So my unwavering recommendation is to use for aerials 3824 UNF. I'll come back to making poles in a bit. Let's go on. The base that I used is very simple. It's the base of an old office chair. It's ideal for indoor use and it's good outside as well because it's all plastic. You might consider cutting off one foot from the base, uh, which is what I've done if you want to use it near a wall. You can see I've cut one leg, one foot of the five off the chair base. It's very easy to do because it's only plastic. Um, if you use the office chair base, you will also need to make a collar or a top hat bush. That's this thing here. And that bush allows the pole to fit in the chair base properly without rocking about. The bush needs to be sized for your base and your aerial pole. So it's something that you have to do for your bits of kit. The bottom of the pole uh, has a thread in it because it's an aerial pole. It has a 3824 thread and there's a cap head screw goes through the hole in the bottom that originally secured the chair um, stem into the chair base. It's as simple as that. So that's the base that I use most of the time if I'm using this thing, especially indoors. However, there is another base that might work better in some cases outdoors, and that's this one. Don't nail this to your floor for whatever you do. But it's simply an aluminium plate with three holes in it. One hole takes the 3824 bolt, and the other two smaller holes take either a tent peg or a, an eight inch nail. And they allow you to peg the whole thing down to the ground uh, and that version needs uh, needs guying at the top of the pole top. In the last picture that I've got to show you, you'll see that guy arrangement. The next part that you need is a surface to write on and to key your rig. A long time ago, I made myself this little board here, which allows me to uh, write and to have a stable platform for my paddle when I'm outdoors. It has magnets embedded in it, two there, one each end to match the magnets on the palm paddle key, and two which are underneath these two, put the paper on top of those and then put two more magnets on the top and it stops them blowing around. It also holds the clip of my pen uh, so it saves me losing that at some crucial moment. So that's the uh, the walkabout version, if you like. And this one is just a larger version of the same thing. It's got magnets here and here for the palm portable key. And here and here, these are the right-hand side ones, but I'm left-handed, so I have all mine on this side. That's why the key is odd if you're a right-hander. It also has holes drilled in it, one there to let the pole 
through, two there with screws through to hold the collar that locks to the pole, and two here that allow me to bolt a strengthening plate and support plate to the bottom. So that's the writing surface or the table surface. The next one is the radio bracket. Now this depends entirely on your radio and your pole. Uh, this particular bracket is made to take a KX3 this side and the K1 here. And it just has to be a stout piece of aluminium. It's got another locking collar here to lock it to the pole. And it's just a stout piece of aluminium angle with brackets on it to hold my radios. You have to do something to hold your radio. And that's up to you, depending on what your radio is. But a K1 has holes in its standard side plates. These are not standard ones. These are ones I've made. But they take uh, screws, which are, uh, again, a UNF, UNC screw, an American screw, uh, into the side plates, and you just make brackets to fit. The next part is the clips and the clamps. <clears throat> the clips that I've got here the bottom clip that supports the brace. This is obviously the whole thing upside down. These clips are called armored cable clips. They're very cheap. You can get them for about 50 pence each from any electrical wholesale supplier. They are made in step sizes. So you have to get the right step size for your pole which allows a big enough gap to um, take the support strut in between the two legs of it when it's clamped up tight onto the pole. So you have to find the right one for you. But if you go into it, any electrical wholesaler, they'll show you what they've got and you can get them to fit. The same sort of clip possibly could be used here if you're stuck for them, but you'd need a bit of ingenuity to do it properly. There's another of those clips here, as you can see, with a six millimeter bolt through it. I chose to make proper split clamps screwed to the table. You can see it's screwed through the top table surface into here. You can see here too, uh, the same clamp used to hold a, a radio um, strut. I accept that these clamps are not necessarily easy to produce without a bit more advanced tooling, but I don't have an easy or a bought alternative to that. My clamps are made from scrap acetal, and I'll talk about acetal in a minute. So that's the basic mechanism of the thing. The hardware that I used for all this, uh, obviously on the aerial itself, or the aerial pole, 3824 UNF for all those parts. The other parts that I used are cap head screws, M6 by one millimeter thread. And I use that right throughout. In fact, I use that sort of stuff for a lot of things that I make. They're all cap head screws. There are plain nuts, there are locking nuts, and there are wing nuts. And I get, I get all of that from Westfield fasteners. Uh, it's a good, a good firm to deal with. The things that I use are all A2 stainless steel, apart from the pole plug-in threads. And that includes everything. They're all A2 stainless. A2 won't go rusty in the rain. It might corrode a little bit in salt water. However, if you submerge the soap in the sea, then you, your radio is trash anyway. So uh, <laughs> you sort that out how you like. But all the 3824 cap head screws and nuts are also A2 stainless. If you want to be really picky, you can go for A4 stainless, which is more salt waterproof, but it's more expensive for no real advantage. 
Um, the armored cable clips, as I've said, you can um, you can go uh, to your electrical wholesaler to find those. Now, let's have a quick chat about acetal. This stuff I think is pure magic. It's easy to work with. It's easy to machine. It takes a thread very well. It's strong and it's a good insulator and it comes in two colors, white and black. That's the only choices you've got, but you can get it in flat plate, in square stock and in round stock. And what's not to like about it? It's just magic stuff. This incidentally is the guy plate that goes on the top of the uh, aerial pole when I'm using the um, soap outdoors. Okay, where are you going to source these materials from? Uh, by the way, there is an alternative to acetal if you really want to get into recycling, and that is to melt down milk cartons. Uh, but you'd have to be pretty keen to do it. Uh, YouTube is your friend if you want to know how to do it, but please make sure you obey the safety warnings as you'll poison your whole household if you overheat the stuff in the oven. So uh, you have been warned. Anyway, acetal, I got mine from the local engineering workshop. Uh, I made friends with them a long time ago and I asked if I could have a look through their uh, scrap box and I ended up with as much of the stuff as I wanted. It's really useful. Um, it goes under other names in various parts of the world, commercial names like Delrin, Sustarin and stuff like that, but acetal will get you what you want usually. The poles, well, I got the best ones that I've got are old tent poles. They're the best ones I've got because they are anodized and that makes them much more pleasant to deal with. It means the aluminium doesn't rub off on your hands or on your clothes. But um, if you're going to use aluminium that's been anodized, you do need to rub it off before you make any kind of electrical connection to it. Um, the longer pole, which is the one that's on most of my pictures with the soap, was an aerial chimney pole for a television aerial. And I pulled it out of a skip where they were doing some work on a house. Um, the shorter poles I got from my local tip, the council tip, and I paid two pounds, I think, for a whole bag of the things. One or two were bent, the rest were straight, they were good. And um, they're ideal for the purpose. But I would urge you to get anodized poles if you can, if you're going to pack them in a suitcase and take them on holiday. Okay, chopping boards. Well, surely you know where to get chopping boards. I got mine from Tesco's. Any supermarket, any kitchen shop should have chopping boards. You get the one you want with the size you want. Fixings and fasteners, I've said there, Westfield fasteners. The only caution I would say about ordering stuff from Westfield and similar people is triple check your order before you press the pay button as it's easy to get sidetracked uh, and look at all the juicy stuff they've got in their catalogue and you click something without realising it and you bought the wrong size or the wrong thickness or some such. Um, you don't have to ask me how I know this, but uh, yes, I'm a sad old man who can get really uh, hyped up looking in a catalogue of nuts and bolts and screws and washers. I use uh, Westfield stuff on my motorbike as well. If you want to use magnets the way I've used them on the boards, then I got mine from emagnets.com and they have a very wide selection, but they're not the only supplier. You'll find what you want if you look on the internet. Now, what to use for tools? Well, use what you've got. If you have a drill and some drill bits, a hacksaw, 
a hammer or two or three works well, four is better, plus some files, you're probably good to go. You'll want spanners and uh, Allen keys and such to fit your hardware and a few other metalworking and woodworking tools. If you want to thread holes in aluminium and acetal and brass, then you will need taps, dies, a die stock, and um, a tap wrench. A note for beginners. If you're going, if you want to thread a hole 3824, don't drill it 3 eighths. It sounds obvious to those who know, but it's not obvious when you first start this game. If you drill a 3-8 hole, you can't cut a 3-8 thread in it. You've drilled it oversize. So get a thread chart, which is free on the internet, and use it to choose your drill size for threading holes. For taps and dies, uh, I use a firm called Tracy Tools in the UK. They are an excellent source for almost anything that, that takes a thread, and they post worldwide. Get high-speed steel if you can afford it or carbon steel if you're cheap. Now, this is the tricky slide. Not everybody has one of these things, but a lathe makes it possible to easily make the clamps for the pole and turn the end plugs for the aerial poles. It will allow you to accurately center threads using taps and dies or on a more advanced machine to make them by screw cutting methods. Now, before you throw up your hands in horror, I want you to consider a lathe is fun. It doesn't have to cost the earth and it doesn't have to take over your life and your garage, though it might do both, but that's a secondary issue. Let me give you food for thought. A certain USA commercial portable dipole will cost you in this country between 260 and 500 pounds, depending on the model. It's only a shortened dipole made from alloy tubing with brass end caps, two loading coils and a couple of telescopic whips in the end with a fancy plastic piece in the middle to attach a feeder. The same maker's single element vertical aerial is approximately 160 pounds. That fancy plastic centerpiece on its own costs £54 in this country. And the irony is that their system was originally introduced to the radio world as a DIY design. I was able to make an equivalent aerial for peanuts. A friend of mine did exactly the same and he was certainly not engineering savvy. I made a copy of that fancy plastic centerpiece for less than a pound. Don't know whether you can see this. Yeah, there we are. That's the one I made out of scrap acetal and aluminium. It cost me a pound to make. That lathe, which you see there, cost me less than 200 pounds second hand. And I would claim my lathe has paid for itself on those two parts alone. Besides, in my personal opinion, buying aerials is for sea beers, sissies, and ne'er-do-wells. And the lathe I used is tiny. If you look, that's a KX3 next to it, just to give you some idea of size. My old RA17L receiver weighed more than this lathe. And when I'm not using it, I pack it away in a sh on a shelf in my garage, close to my ML7. That's a joke for anybody that knows what an ML7 is. This is what happens when a lathe does take over your garage, your time and your life. So how do we make poles? Well, first of all, find your tubing. This is a piece of that tent pole that I uh, talked about earlier. You need to cut it to the length that you require and you need to clean out any electroplating from the inside. So any anodizing, you just um, get some emery cloth up the inside of it, possibly on an electric drill. If you um, cut a slot in a piece of doweling, you can slip the emery into the slot 
and then um, put it up the inside of the tube with your drill behind it. Clean out the electroplating and the irregularities from the inside and measure the inside diameter. Use a pair of calipers for that. And then you need to find some stock. This is a piece of brass, which I pulled out of somebody's uh, rubbish bin. And these, this is going to make the end plugs. And you can see in the other picture uh, on my bigger lathe, I've got the stock put in the chuck and I'm beginning to turn an end piece. That piece there, when it's turned down to size, will receive the 3824 male thread. Make the plugs long enough so that they support the pole against reasonable wind pressure. So the bit that goes inside wants to be about two and a half times the diameter of the pipe so that you've got some reasonable support in there. Take care what material you use for these plugs. Um, the best two things that I can think of are brass and stainless steel, but stainless is pretty heavy. Brass is heavy too. If the threaded plugs are aluminium, then it can cause galling when you screw it into another aluminium thread in another pole. And that means the threads will jam and you won't easily get them apart. Besides, screwing aluminium into aluminium feels horrible. So you chuck up the stock and you start to machine it. And you want the fit of this stock here to be a drive fit, a driven fit into that pole. So you need it to be, I would aim for around three foul bigger than the hole in the end of the, of the pipe, the end of the tube. Three foul, that's 0.07 to 0.08 millimeters if you want it in metric. You cut the 3.8 thread on the end of the male piece, you drill and tap the female for 3824 and you make sure that you uh, finish them properly so that there is no taper on the bottom of the male thread here and you also countersink slightly the female here but you uh, tap both of them and then it's quite simply a matter of um, making it a drive fit, which means you do it like this. You just literally hammer the plug in. I'm using a rubber hammer there. Otherwise, use a piece of wood. If you're going to use an ordinary hammer, a piece of wood between the plug and the hammer. But you hammer the plug in and you use a th thick piece of wood on the other end, which has got the male thread on it with a hole in it so that you can put the male thread in and protect it. You don't bang it on the ground. And you should end up with something like this. There's the male thread there in an older pole. And that was an aluminium plug, I think, on this one. And you can see that one screws into there. Now, I hope this description has um, been helpful to one or two and interesting to everybody else. But even if you feel it's all beyond you, there is a message to this. You may not be able to build a high performance radio, but you can build something. Look around and see what's to hand and make an aerial, make some side panels or a mounting plate or a project box or a battery holder, make something. Much of this is very, very simple. If you look at this, this is the K1. I made this stand for my K1 years ago. It's literally two pieces of hardboard and the screws go in the side. Originally I bought screws and then eventually I made myself some thumb screws here. And you can see that supports the K1, gets it up off the ground and lifts the back end off the ground so that any connectors are not dragging in the dirt. There are new side panels on the K1 and on the KX3 and I made them out of scrap aluminium. Here there's some battery units 
and these take ordinary rechargeable AA cells and they're made from water uh, overflow pipe and in the back end of them they have um, caps from copper plumbing pipe. They happen to be the right size, they fit up inside the pipe and they take a, an AA battery inside them. So they're protecting the batteries and making a good contact and the wires are just soldered on. There's all sorts of things you can do. There's some other bits and pieces that I've made over time. Supports for my radios. Obviously this is a mountain topper radio with a Elecraft uh, aerial tuning unit. Here's an aerial on a rucksack with a base and connectors. All sorts of bits and pieces, whatever you want to make, whatever you feel you need. It makes your uh, experience outdoors just that bit better because it's something that you have made. And just look at the benefits. My shack never looks as good as this. Uh, this is Lynn Brennig in Wales. Some of you may know it. And we were operating a club station up there one day. So I did it on the shack, on the, sh the shack on a pole. There's the power unit. There's the two radios. My iPad, which my wife was using to take a picture of me, fits in here. There's the guy uh, arrangement for the top of the pole. Stop it getting blown over. I hope this has been of interest and whatever stuff you've got, you can create something that will make your radio experience just a bit better because you made it yourself. Thank you for listening. I'm around for questions and I will uh, answer questions via email. My email is available on qrz.com if you want it. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, lads, for that. Um, right then, let's see what questions we've got in the chat. So I've got a question from Dave N8SBE, who's asked, would the black uh, acetyl be carbon filled and therefore not uh, suitable for antenna parts? As far as I know, it's a good insulator at RF. I've never had a problem with it. I've never tested it. I haven't actually got the equipment to test it with, but um, I would say it's fine. Um, I think that is pretty much it from the questions. <laughs> There's some... I've knocked them all out, I've frightened them all away. Well, there's certainly some uh, stories between people about uh, getting certain antenna sticks stuck together and having to try and uh, get them apart. Go on, try yeah. that one then. Uh, so, again, uh, Dave, NASBE, asked uh, if anyone else has uh, gold or jammed the telescoping uh, telescopic uh, whip into the top of the coil housing. Don't have handies, so <laughs> I can't answer that one. Um, that, yeah. If there's any more questions, please do add them in. Ooh, here we are. Uh, Mark KR3AM has uh, asked if you have any tips for learning uh, to lathe or use a lathe. Um, one of the classic books <clears throat> is called How to Run a Lathe. If you look up that title on the internet, you'll find somebody has done a reprint of a very old book, which was produced by South Bend, an American lathe manufacturer. And there's lots of tips in there about how to run big and small lathes. Um, the lathe that I showed you a photo of, the Tag lathe, is, uh, there is a book specific to that. Um, it's now out of print, but probably bits and pieces of it are available on the internet. There, 
there are so many machining um, YouTube channels where you'll pick up tips. Um, you'll find out how to do stuff. That's the best source, really. YouTube is your friend on that. Or a friend who already has a lathe who can perhaps show you and give you the chance to get hands-on experience on their lathe. Okay, uh, Matt M Nord T E U has asked, "Is there any books regarding metalworking that you could uh, recommend?" Oh, um, there are a lot of metalworking books in the model making uh, realm, and most of those, if you again. It, look them up on the internet and you'll you'll find out which are the better ones and which are not i'll be honest i'd get most of my stuff off of youtube and i watch channels like uh, this old tony some of you may know this old tony a uh, very very funny man who gets across uh, teaching points by using humor and he's very skilled um, Blondie Hacks is another one, a Canadian lady who um, is very good. Um, there are hundreds. There really are hundreds. If you want to get really technical, Stefan Gottswinter in Germany um, and people like that. There are some to avoid, but if you go for this old Tony and Blondie Hacks, I think you'd, you'd do pretty well. Uh, Steve's given us a hint. The VK Free XU project books from the club sales have some good metalworking tips in them. Uh, some people agreeing about Blondie Hacks being amazing. Oh, good. Uh, I agree with you on the Australian books. They are brilliant. Uh, he has quite a lot of metalworking stuff because he's a model maker as well as a radio ham. Uh, they are good. Um, that is it, I believe. Okay, that's fine. Hello. Thanks very much. Thank you. Really I've good. enjoyed it. <laughs> good. I'm sure you've inspired us all to start playing around <laughs> and, and certainly go dumpster diving, skip diving. Well, if I can get you to do that, that'll be brilliant. Excellent. Thank you. So the next you. session is Vector Network Analyzers, and that starts at 10 past 3 UTC or 10 past 4 um, BST. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thank I'll you. Close the uh, meeting now.